we'll got Russell back. All right, and and here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen McNeil. I'm the author of the Wine Bible and the editor of Wine Speed, the digital newsletter. And this is the Great Wines of Oakville, episode number three. Um, <laughs> we'll continue these great sessions uh, next week with episodes four through six. And you'll always find that schedule on, on winespeed.com. But we want to thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and for me, it's been an extraordinary pleasure to attempt to get just a little bit closer to what makes these wines so distinctive. The wines of Oakville, it's well known here in the Napa Valley, have a, a kind of place on the pedestal of Napa Valley wine that um, is uncontestable. And uh, deciding or at least attempting to figure out through flavor and taste why that is has been a great pleasure. And we're moving forward down that line um, in the tasting today. So as many of you know, Oakville is right in the heart of the Napa Valley and the sheer number of top estates here is um, amazing really. And not just now, um, I was thinking this morning that it's astounding that a hundred years before any AVA, American Viticultural Association was established, a hundred years before the Napa Valley AVA was established. Already vintners were gravitating to this one small place, Oakville. So many of the great estates are here. And somehow, even more than a hundred years ago, people knew that this was a very special terroir. In fact, I mean, for many of us, this is a little bit where the first growths of the Napa Valley are. So who's here with me? Let me, um, let me introduce, introduce, excuse me, our, our wonderful um, vintners and winemakers today. Suzanne Groff is the president and CEO of Groff, and you see Suzanne here. Russell Bevan is the co-owner and winemaker of Bevan Cellars, and Tor Kenward is the co-owner of Tor. And I guess Tor, we could also say, kind of the I don't know, the, the, the winemaking, um, the muse of winemaking um, uh, for tour as well. So, yeah, I think so. Right? I like so, that, Karen. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I'm quite sure you have a big hand in how these wines, how your wines taste. I'm, I'm amused so, and sometimes amused by all this. Yes. <laughs> um, so before we, um, before we, uh, launch in to not only the, the tasting itself and the history of these three small family estates. Let's give a little context. If we could bring up a Google map, those of you who have joined us before know that we have, um, we've done mm. this each time because it's helpful for just a second to see where we are. So to orient you, here we are in the Napa Valley. You see Highway 29, the north south road they're going and you see that oakville spans the entire heart of the napa valley it goes from east to west it's about five miles across and about two miles north to south so it's a tiny tiny place constituting only nine percent of all the wine made in the napa valley which already hmm. is a tiny place so we are, it's going to be fascinating today's tasting because all three of these estates are in the same small neighborhood in a small place. You could almost throw, well, maybe I couldn't, but I don't know, probably Russell could throw a baseball between them. So Groff is the most central and you see Groff there right, right in the, the heart of the heart, so to speak. Um, on an old alluvial fan that used to come out of those eastern mountains. And then we'll move over to Bevan, um, where the wine we'll be tasting is from the Tench Vineyard. Right there you go, right there. And you see just south of that, this is, of course, a wonderful neighborhood. Look there, Screaming Eagle right below it. Um, and then we'll move over to Tor, very close by, 
from the Tierra Rioja, or excuse me, Roja, not Rioja, Roja Vineyard, um, a little jewel of a vineyard right there. Um, if you've ever been in the Napa Valley and you've driven across the Oak Grove Crossroad, you know you hit highway, excuse me, um, Silverado Trail right there and you look up and here's this beautiful gem of a hillside vineyard. All three of these producers, by the way, are family owned, um, an important point because that's true for, um, for Oakville in general. Um, so we're gonna get to the histories of um, Suzanne Russell and Tor of your wineries in a second. But first I wanna ask kind of a big picture question because even though this is our third tasting, we haven't really tackled this quite so much. And that is, so I know your wines, we're tasting them right now and I've had them before and I know how distinctive the wines are and they're from distinctive places within Oakville. But that said, right, Oakville is an ABA um, and it has a character too. So imagine you were I don't know, someplace sitting in a dinner table beside someone who had never had an Oakville wine. What three words would you use to describe the wines of Oakville? Mm. Uh, I'd go wall to wall carpeting. Oh, uh, wall to wall carpeting. I mean, Let's see, is it, that three it, words? It, it uh, just, wall to wall carpeting. It, it just went on your palate, uh, the best of Oakville, and I think it's well represented here. You have, you know, you have the front part of the palate that's attacked. You have this usually really nice broad mid palate, which I think is very Oakville. And then you have that wonderful finish. So I, I always think the best of Oakville is that wall to wall carpeting that, um, you know, it just, it covers all parts of the palate. I love that. I love that description, but you are showing your age here, Tor. Yeah. I just I, want you to know. Nobody will, knows what wall-to-wall -wall carpeting is anymore, but okay. I will the entire hour. I, I'm afraid I'm sucked. <laughs> I am a man of period. All right. Um, Suzanne? But, you know, it's, it's more of like when you are on the Oakville, the Trinity Pass that goes from Glen Ellen over the Mayakama into Oakville, and as just as you're coming down the grade, uh, for those cyclists out there, you're going 42 miles an hour at this point, grip the brakes, but stop and check out the carpet of green that stretches out. Like it just is such a cohesive, gorgeous spot to see how Oakville stretches out. And that's the view that my parents probably first saw. And I think that convinced <laughs> they had been looking at Vineyard in Sonoma. They had looked at Vineyard all over and literally they, they got that view they saw it and they're like, holy cow, this is a really stunning view. This seems like vineyard to me. And yeah, and I can imagine there are lots of the our- The green, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine there are lots of our viewers right now who are um, thinking, gosh, had I only been going over as your parents were in whatever, we'll ask you later, the 70s or something, when these vineyards a cost a fraction of what they did. They do um, now. And I want to, before, uh, before Russell answers, I just want to remind everyone that we're going to take questions. Um, we'll take questions throughout and some questions at the end. But Russell, your three words. Um, power, refinement, and complexity. And the great thing about Oakville is we're our own unique ABA and you can literally break Oakville up into sections within Oakville. It, it's appropriate that the three of us are together today because we, we started at Suzanne and her parents' property. We go to Tierra Roja and then we're at Tench. The Eastern Oakville side is completely mm -hmm. different than the mm -hmm. Western side. And whereas Oakville represents those three qualities to me, they represent themselves differently east to west. And yeah. the, the, if you start at the great wines of Tokelon and the McDonald family, and then you go <laughs> over to what's being done at Dalavale and Oakville East, it's so completely different that to just say Oakville has three qualities, you're gonna be stressed to get three, but we yeah. all have concentration, complexity, and refinement. And okay. that, that's yeah. the, the commonality. Outside of that, you can taste our wine side by side, east to west, and, and it's like we're different ABAs. The level and standard of excellence is consistent, 
but the styles can vary so much because of the, the different soil types, the red dirt at Tierra Roja, the great drainage and the rock that you get at Groth, and then the completely different profiles coming down from the mountains on the far side. So to me, Oakville represents a unique combination of qualities and excellence that every site is different. If you read the winemaker's dance, they break out each and every part and, and Oakville is magic in its diversity. That's, a, that's so well said, Russell. And the winemaker's right on, dance Russell. is um, a, a book that anyone who loves Napa Valley should have written by the geologist David Howell and, um, oh, who am I thinking of? You know, the our, our oh, other, yeah. think of his name in a moment. Um, uh -huh. But you could certainly, um, Swinchat, Jonathan Swinchat, um, two phenomenal geologists who look very specifically at the Napa Valley. And um, before we move on to histories, I just wanna say, if you imagine a valley running north-south and there's an eastern side where all these wines are from and there's a western side, right? One of the things without even knowing geology, one of the things that we consumers know is that the sun moves over these vineyards, right? And the sun sets in the west. So all these vineyards that we are tasting, these three vineyards that we're tasting this afternoon, get this beautiful afternoon, early evening sun that is setting in the west. That's a lot of sun. And so these wines have a lot of ripeness. Um, there's never a case, I think I can say, in which these wines would be anything less than beautifully full of fruit and softness and ripeness. So with that, but let's talk about history for a second, because then everybody wants to taste, I know. Suzanne, your winery is the oldest here. Um, tell us about it, because your parents founded it, right? We did. So after that, you know, fateful trip, um, we were invited by Ren Harris and Jean Phillips, who were uh, selling real estate in Napa Valley. In fact, if you look back in Oakville, Oakville couldn't be the same without Ren and Jean. A dynamic duo, Ren formed his own winery paradigm. Of course, Jean formed Screaming Eagle, and they shared a common winemaker, Heidi Barrett, Heidi Peterson at the time, excuse me, and then, uh, of course, then she married Bo Barrett into the Chateau Monolina family. So already we're getting into name dropping here, aren't we? And that's what happens every time I talk about the hood or the neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, whenever people ask me what is so unique about Oakville, I immediately defer to the brands. And I say, oh, well, it, you know, you have Farniente, Gil and Beth arrived in 1982, the year my parents arrived here as well. Silver Oak was, although they don't make an Oakville wine, they were quietly making their first vintages and founding the foundation of their winery. Opus One broke ground in 1982. There was some, there was some excitement, a lot of things happening. And although my parents didn't know much about wine, they are an accountant, uh, a financial guy from Atari video games. And, and my mom was taking care of us kids. And I was in middle school at the time. My parents moved me up here from San Jose, where we were from and where we were living, and uh, threw me into St. Helena High School. So it was, uh, it, was, it was an interesting entry, but I feel so lucky to have met the cast of characters that were here at the time. And, and Bonnie and Justin Meyer are part of our story. Justin was literally forming Silver Oak. He had a day job at Franciscan. He planted this vineyard. This vineyard was not a vineyard until 1970 when he introduced Vitis vinifera to it. It was a dairy ranch all through pro post-prohibition, the depression, and it really was an interesting um, development to come into vineyard. And he loved the vineyard so much that he kept five acres and a house for himself to raise his three young children in. So I guess you could say my first job in the wine business was babysitting Bonnie and Justin's children. They were, you know, eight, seven and probably just 24 months at the time. Bonnie was all by herself in the middle of a vineyard. She saw a teenager and she grabbed me. So those are the first wines I remember tasting, a really silver oak. And of course, trying my parents' wine as well, so. Yes, and Justin yeah. Oak, uh, I, oh, excuse me, Justin Meyer, a very um, famous, famous part of Napa Valley um, history and a former Franciscan um, brother um, and the winemaker for the Christian Brothers until he went out and formed Silver Oak. Russell, you were about to say? Um, 
Didn't they make a, a vineyard designate, Bonnie's Vineyard from Oakville that was right adjacent to your, your parents' property? He did. He just, yeah. Thank you. Justin was so complimentary about that one piece of vineyard. He loved it so much that he, um, he kind of basically convinced the owners at the time, a bank, a third party, who hired him to plant the vineyard to let him have five acres in the house to finish raising his family in. Karen mentioned that he was a brother. Of course, he did have to drop out of the Christian Brotherhood. to get married. And... <laughs> but that's another story, my friends. But, you know, he introduced my parents to Nils Vangi, who became their first winemaker, their first general manager. Fantastic. He was yeah. working next door at what was known as Villamont Eden. That was the cab that brought my parents to, it was a 76 Villamont Eden. And today, of course, that winery is, is Plump Jack. But I mean, again, name dropping, right? Every time I talk about the neighborhood, I just, I brag on the neighbors. Suzanne, yeah. um, I, just a quick question. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have a vertical of your wines with you and um, the reserve program is very distinct and very focused and it's got a lot of history now. I, I think you had the first 100 point wine, right? Yeah, back in the uh, yeah. Tori, anyway. you're jumping ahead. Wait, wait, wait. You're jumping I, ahead. I, I'm just curious what the reserve program is. So maybe we'll okay. get into that later. We that will. Okay? We will. But why okay. don't you why don't you tell us your history first? Let's get all the histories yeah. uh, done here. You want mine? No. Yes. Oh, okay. Because well, I know because Tori, you and I have known each other for more than 35 years. We have. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, well, you said 40 know. yesterday, but it, it uh -huh. might be I, I amended it to 35 because I felt that if I said 40, it would just, you know, be just too much. But okay. um, I met you old. when you were a part of Behringer um, as the head of communications in its heyday when Behringer made many of the greatest single vineyard Cabernets in the Napa Valley. But then you went out on your own. Why was that? Well, uh, I, I came up to Napa in the mid 70s, 75, 76 as a buyer. I had a jazz club in Southern California and uh, a bunch of friends introduced me to fine wines and said, go up to Napa and buy wines for a couple stores that we have. And, and uh, I came up, fell in love with Napa Valley. Yes, I was with Behringer as a uh, vice president for about 25 years. Uh, very involved in the winemaking and the direction of the private reserve program for both the, the Chardonnay and the Cabernet. Um, and after about 25 years, I actually, you know, when I came up to Napa Valley in the 70s, uh, the only way that I could probably visit, or not probably, just stay in the valley for a week, see winemakers, was to camp at both the Napa State Park. By the time I had retired from Behringer, I actually had enough money to start a winery and do exactly what I wanted to do. And after those 30 years of kick and dirt in Napa Valley, I really feel that Napa is much more of a burgundy model when you, and you look, you will look at that map that you showed. You, you had all those small little plots of land that were owned by growers. Um, uh, obviously estates like Roth, but Russell and I go hunting every day of our lives, sniffing dirt, looking for great blocks and great vineyards. Uh, and I look at having been to Burgundy many, many years, over many years, that is much more of what Napa Valley is now than really Bordeaux. Uh, obviously Cabernet's king, uh, and it certainly is at this tasting. Uh, Bordeaux varieties, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, uh, Malbec, et cetera. But if you look at it, it's really a grower's world here. Mm. So what my business model and my passion really is, is to try to get into if you want to use Burgundy as the, as the model, I want Armand Rousseau's block in Chambertin. I want Comte de Vogue's block in Lusigny. I want those blocks of grapes. And mm -hmm. I, I really feel very strongly that if you're able to get into those blocks of grapes over a long period of time, 
that is something that you can pass down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And um, it, that's the business model right now. So Tierra, All right. yeah, Tierra well, Rohan fits in that very well. That's an incredible um, idea, and we can, we can re-examine that towards the end. But I want to also hear from Russell now about beginning Bevan, because I was saying to him earlier, as we were just all jumping on, that um, I hadn't realized that uh, he wrote a wine column for the Chicago Tribune for a while, and this has given that. me an infinite amount of hope about my own future here. <laughs> you know, uh, Russell, I could be a competitor at some point. I, I didn't know. I, heaven forbid, Karen. Um, you know, Bevan Sellers was created when Victoria and I had the opportunity to move back to California. And our joint love of wine had dominated everything when we first met. Our first dates were spent blind tasting each other on wines. She'd bring two bottles of wine in brown bags. I'd bring two bottles of wine in brown bags. And, we built our palates and then in Minneapolis had an amazing wine tasting group and I'm fifth generation Santa Rosa, which means I have issues, but my family is Santa Rosa. But we moved back to California and Cal Shokit, Eastern Oakville, offered us a ton of grapes. We made this ton of grapes and we had 12 friends coming. We removed every grape by hand and plump grapes went into one bin slightly dimpled in another, desiccated in the third. And we fermented them differently. And three days into a cold soak, they were also vastly different. We were both so captivated. Our lives had absolutely changed. And we okay. knew at that point in time, we were going to build Bevan Cellars. Three years later, we had $750,000 in credit card debts. <laughs> how much? Wait, wait, how everything. much? Everything. Three quarters of a million dollars. In okay, never mind. I'm not following in your footsteps. <laughs> and we we built that brand up and up, and luckily we had had a, a, a little critical success, and, and we were able to to then be successful and grow the program. But you know, I'm blessed. I'm one of the few people on this planet doing what he was born to do. I get up every day. I walk vineyards. I go to the winery. I have an amazing team, and. In, in my mind, great winemaking isn't artistry. You're a steward of what Mother Nature gives you. You have a, a clean, sanitary facility. You have a dedicated people who have great attention to detail, and then you taste lots of wine, and you craft it. Mother Nature gives winemakers flavors. We make sure it has balance, which is so easy to do in Oakville. And so, yeah. Evan Sellers is simple. It was two people who loved wine, were passionate about it and who went all in in the biggest way and well here we are but what's funny is when I was writing Victoria and I went online back when there was Usenet boards alt food wine and we met a dozen people and we did our first trip to California with all these strangers we met on the internet and people were like these people are gonna be crazy what are you doing and we all met in the San Francisco airport rented a couple of vans and headed to Napa. Our first stop was Groth. Michael Weiss <laughs> met all of us. We brought 12 vintages of Groth Reserve. Michael was like, okay, guys, you've got me, but you only have me for 45 minutes. I've got a bocce ball game, and it's really important. It's the end of the season, and my team needs me. And so here we are with 12 bottles, starting with the 85, the first 100-point wine ever in from Robert Parker in California. And, and we get halfway through that bottle, and he's like, okay, we're down to about 20 minutes. <laughs> we, we then plied him a little bit, and he was graciously late. But we started at Groff because for us, that was holy grail of Oakville back then. The current vintage was the 90, and the 91 was just coming out. And these wines had this fabulous intensity, but then they also had, and, and I consider this a compliment to what Oakville can do, the best Cabernets from Oakville have a kiss of herbaceousness to them. It's not vegetative, but it's dried herbs. In this 16 Groth Reserve we're drinking today, absolutely exemplifies that quality. Tor, do you well, have let's a go, glass? Let's, actually, Russell, yeah. thank you for, um, for moving us there. Let's go to the tasting. And I want to remind everyone who is joining us, thank you again 
I want to remind you um, that you can hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and ask um, some questions because I know we have a huge number of people already on. And in fact, um, that was such a polite way of telling me to hush up. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> hey, you know, been doing it for a while. Uh, just teasing. Um, but let's start with the growth. And then I, I have a question on pricing that has just come in. Thank you, um, the viewer who uh, provided that question. But let's get into the tasting a teeny bit before we tackle uh, pricing. So let's start with the growth, which, um, which Russell was, was doing. And um, one of the things that we always like to do, you know, I, um, I insisted that all three of you taste all three wines. So you're not there just with your own wine, but you're there with, with um, everyone's wine, um, all three of your wines. And it's, um, it's better that way, right? Because we, we can taste style among other things. We can taste style and um, imagine a little bit uh, of what this wine might be, um, the, the, the philosophy behind it. So Suzanne, we're tasting your grot right now. Um, these are all 2016s, by the way, a great vintage in the Napa Valley. Um, really such beautiful, beautifully structured wines. And um, before we ask Tor or Russell, what do you think about this wine? Don't tell us how it was made, but what do you think I, about it? Yeah, I mean, it was very kind of Tor and Russell to say such lovely things about the wines and, and the history of the wine program. I think the reserve for me is, you know, Tor brought it up. I mean, it's it's a vineyard within a vineyard. It is, there are 27 and 0.7 acres, we've mapped it, of our premier soil. And it has to do with that rock you mentioned earlier. That's not supposed to be there. It's a, a toe of an alluvial deposit out of uh, the Childs River Valley before the Vaca Range was formed. And walking the vineyard with David Howell, we mentioned earlier, kind of gave us that keystone. We knew from working and living next to Justin Meyer that it was a sweet spot in the vineyard, as he always referred to it as. He shared that with Nils. Nils shared that with my parents. And really, I give it up to Nils because he had to convince my parents. He didn't make it the 1982 vintage, our first vintage. He started the reserve program in 83. So truly it's a vineyard designate. The Cabernet must come from that source. And it is just that Western bank. And it, it is not to do with the concrete. We are on the bank of the concrete, but it's not the concrete itself. It's really a much more ancient deposit that would have happened you know, a millennia ago. So chert is the sedimentary stone that is the marker that shows us where those soils come from. And it's just rock. Um, it's very well drained. The reserve works very hard. The root structures there are much deeper. It's more plush, more plummy, more velvety, more grothy, if you will, right? Than our Oakville Cabernet that also comes from this estate and from the rest of Oakville. We buy some grapes for our Oakville Cab. And, but this reserve is truly a wine of place, a wine of estate, as opposed to a, a selection or blending where you sometimes see that in the reserve program. But Nils, he invented the whole concept. I love this idea of grothiness. <laughs> that is a, a good term. And um, uh, David Howell, who is a good friend of mine too, the geologist, says that there's a lot of chert in this vineyard, as you just mentioned. Chert um, actually starts as a sedimentary organism that, be that begins as a living thing and becomes rock. It's a really interesting um, that's about as far as I can go on the geology of church, but, um, um, but it, it is fascinating. And one thing I must say I really like about this wine uh, before we move on is actually all three of these wines have a component called savoriness. And I think um, Russell referred to this earlier too. It's this idea that there's, there's some kind of delicious umami, you can imagine herbs steeped in meat juices or something that is um, very savory, not sweet, but savory, um, that makes these wines extra complex. Erin, weren't um, you the one who said we need to keep this clean? I, 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 
I don't know. Maybe I said that earlier, but um, you know, it's 20 minutes in. I could change my mind. All right. We're okay. moving on. Let, let, let me talk about this wine for just a second, please. Yes, please. So, no, 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 no. That plum is the right word. The, the plum is there, but what makes Groth different is when you look at the, the middle of Oakville, and Groth is the epicenter for what's important on Oakville Crossroad, there's all kinds of heavy soil surrounding it. Then there's three or four small pieces of dirt that are fabulous. Bonnie's, this block, then it's surrounded by heavy clay. That This is a, 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 a piece of Mother Nature's gift and love for wine that this wine exists. And it tastes like something that comes from well-drained rocky soils. It's completely different from what Tor has crafted and what from my what, what my team has crafted. This speaks to rocky drained soils, not a hillside or really red soils. And that's the difference within just what? We're saying three quarters of a mile from your vineyard to Suzanne's, correct? Very Tor? small. Yeah. And, and I mean dramatically different. Dramatically and, and be, different. Between the those two vineyards, there's a lot of soil that's best for Pinot Gris, which Nils Vengi told me and then then planted. But this is such a polite, well-behaved, sophisticated gentleman's wine. Then then you have Tor's wine and well, Tor's wine likes to dance slowly late at night. It's uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's fabulous. And, and Russell's hey, wine hey, likes hey, to I'm supposed to be the one with all the good words and good metaphors. <laughs> Russell, you're you're stealing my show here. Um, that's a fabulous metaphor. Well, you invited um, us. You asked for this. All right. Yes, I know. Okay, but we're going now. We have to put Russell on the spot. Let's taste the Bevan, and this is from the Tench Vineyard. EE, -E. we're going to ask him what EE -E means in a second. Tench Vineyard, I remind you, is actually all three of these vineyards in this fabulous little neighborhood with Bacchus, Dal Valley on the top, um, Tierra Roja, Rudd, Screaming Eagle. It's just this, uh, the Bon St. Eden, Roth. It's just this fabulous little neighborhood. And Tench right there, sandwiched in the middle. Um, so, Russell. Tell us about, I've, I've been tasting all three of these wines for a bit of time now. I opened them a little bit early, not very early, but maybe an hour, because I know that this east side of Oakville, the wines need a few minutes of air, right? They, they're they really packed. You just need it to, the Chinese would say, as with tea, unfurl themselves. Anyway, it's finally unfurled. Tell us about it. Um, we like to make massive concentrated wines with the refined <laughs> textures. If you are opening a bottle of Bevan Cellars Cabernet, especially from the Tench Vineyard, you're going to get a massive, huge, dense wine that never has hard tannins. We truly feel as a winemaking team, and Victoria and I talked about this early on, and we then reached out to some of the great winemakers in Napa Valley. Uh, Philip Tony and Nils Vengi and Bob Foley and said, okay, we want to capture these qualities in a wine. What would you recommend? And Philip, the bloody old goat, I love him so much. He, he, he would lecture me not to try to tame a wine's textures, but I wanted to make something with technology that would allow us, not great technology, just we, we pulse air through our fermentations instead of some of our punch downs and pump overs so we can get this type of extraction with really refined textures. So Bevan Cellars is gonna give you massive, but it's never going to be rough and treat you hard. This is a, this is a wine you can drink in the dark and be very happy. Drink in the dark? Absolutely. What? You never have a glass what of wine mean? at the nightstand when you're pondering life? I, I, I'll put a great glass of wine, sit in the dark and think about the world's great mysteries. What else okay. is it? Well, here we have it. And tell us, and before we go to tour, what does EE -E mean? A very good friend. When Victoria and I were broke, we had a couple thousand dollars in our checking account, came to the house and tasted with us. He said, you have to be blowing up. Your brand's got to be getting huge. And we said, we might skip the next vintage. We can't afford to buy corks, bottles, and labels. He said, look, I don't give anybody money, but you bring all these wines to my house in New Jersey, 
let me pour them for all my friends and let's see if we can't sell you enough wine to let you buy those labels, corks and everything else. We flew to New Jersey on every last frequent flyer mile we had. We stayed at a Motel 6 right outside of the Jersey airport and we went to his house and he'd taken an order form off of our website, which was so rinky dink and filled it out for each one of the guests who showed up with quantities they were purchasing, their home address, his office is the shipping address. All they had to do was sign it and put a credit card in the expiration date. We sold over $40,000 worth of wine. It allowed us to bottle that vintage, which then literally two months after that, we got reviews that were very positive. We sold out of all that wine within a two month period and allowed us to grow and build, build, the, build the brand. There would not be Bevan Sellers like it is today without Double E. And so in, in any industry, if you disrespect karma, you disrespect yourself and your project. And so mm. I will never not make my Cabernet Cabernet Franc blend named EE after Eric for the great gift he gave us and all the support he had, he had for us. That's right, cool. It's such an important story and it's, um, it, it just reminds us how much of a people business the wine business is and how it is it's a it's a it's a business that connects people together and that shows incredible compassion what a great story and well, let's taste it. this will be my last ramble for a bit sorry guys what's been so amazing coronavirus is horrible it's destroying so many people's lives but napa's alive winemakers are out walking vineyards the interaction we're able to have because people who bought our wines now have the time to taste them and send notes. I'm getting so many amazing notes from people. Oh my goodness, I tried this recipe with this wine. Yeah. And one of the takeaways has been is people have been able to reconnect with their love of food and wine. And I hope that stays because this valley has suffered so much since the fires. And that there's been kind of a rebirth in the energy of wine online and in the media and great wine makes everything better and if you're having a bad week because you've been locked in for a while you call up a friend and share two bottles of wine and by god you're gonna have a fabulous night great wine makes everything better is absolutely the the theory that we we all um are operating on and that we all know and that we all love thank you for saying that tor let's taste your wine um continuing the great wine idea. And um, I, I do, it was interesting to hear Russell say, you know, call up a friend and open two bottles. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I, Russell's always had a good head on his shoulders. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we, of course, would all the do- big head, but it's a good head. <laughs> so I, I Polished it and washed it. So it wouldn't just for shiny. this occasion. <laughs> it looks good, Russell. Looks good. Did it have anything to do with the note we sent you ahead of time that said clean up and you know be be present? Um, it took a shower. Yeah. Up straight. Okay, Tor, we love yes. this wine. Okay. And this is I agree with you. Um, I took the word jewel right from you because this is a jewel of a vineyard, and it is that beautiful. It's astoundingly red. I feel like I should stand there, redhead, red shirt, stand in that soil. Yeah. Right? It's anytime. It's, it's incredible, and this is a beautiful wine. Tell us, tell us why you like your own wine, but you should. Well, I'm I mean, sure you th do. this fits into so much of the dialogue that we've had. Um, you know, um, about the east side. You know, Russell talked about that, and Suzanne's talked about that. It is different from the west. Uh, what you have here, uh, and uh, the, the name of the vineyard is Tierra Roja. So it's this very red, red landslide soil from the Vaca Mountain range. Uh, you know, it was formed, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. Actually, the, the beginning of Napa Valley and this whole Oakville area goes back 140 million years ago. But this is a rare soil type. And... What I love about this vineyard is it's only four acres. The neighbor on the top, as you saw on your map, was Dolly Ball, which makes a very distinctive wine. Right down below it, you have Rudd, and then Tench is over there on the side, 
Over just south of that is uh, Bacchus up on the hill. It's all of us in this tasting, they're, they're calling it, I've heard some people refer to it as the Miracle Mile of Oakville East. And it kind of is. I mean, it's this, you get these little ribbons of that red volcanic landslide soil and they're special wines. What fascinates me about Russell's wine and this wine, because they're very close to each other. The Tench Vineyard uh, is, is right down below and it has some of that wonderful red soil, landslide uh, soil types in there, as does Screaming Eagle. Uh, which is right next to Tetch. Yeah. Tor, let me ask you a question though. When you when you said ribbons of that red volcanic soil, did you mean literal physical ribbons, or did you mean ribbons of flavor that connect these? Well, these, that these that whole soil type is so different than almost any other soil type yeah, in Napa it's Valley. It's unique. landslide. So what happened is that east side collapsed a long time ago and came down as a landslide. Tierra Roja is 100% that red soil. And as it hit the valley floor and moved around, you actually have ribbons of that in Tench. You have it in uh, Screaming Eagle. Uh, I think it extends through parts of broth. Uh, it's this very valued, interesting soil type that all of us winemakers follow. I mean, I buy Russell's wines or we trade uh, and Groth. We, we, we track these things. It, it's a unique soil type that makes a unique wine. This is a very steep vineyard. So we pick the lower part, even though it's just four acres. It's, it is the smallest vineyard in, in the group that we're, we're tasting with. But even though it's just four acres, we have to pick the lower part different than the upper part, and they're distinctly different wines, because it's so steep. You go down, boom, boom. Um, what fascinates me about this wine, flavor profile-wise, you would think it would be big, dark fruit flavors, and year in, year out, it's it's got a lot of the red fruits in it. It does have red fruits in it, I agree. Yeah. Red and, fruits, and all three of these wines, um, you know, we, I, f for me, one of the things that here we are in, um, you know, the, the heart of the heart, right? The Oakville, the heart of the Napa Valley, and then the richness of this Eastern side. So you're, you're tempted, I'm tempted anyway, in our office tastings to think, okay, there's gonna be a lot of lush fruit here. And of course there is a lot of lush fruit, but then you have to taste to me, I always try to remind myself, taste under that fruit and taste for these other things. Taste for stones, taste for a sense of minerality and saltiness, taste for savoriness, umami, taste for that little backdrop of sagey green Cabernet uh, character. And um, if the wine were very simple and inexpensive, none of those would be uh, evident, um, but those are so evident to me in all three of these wines right now. We have some questions. I want to um, a couple uh, a tour are for you that are pretty uh, involved. I'm going to email them <laughs> to you instead <laughs> because they have to do with um, uh, Andy Beckstoffer and Tokalon, and we probably all read that. Um, uh, New York Times piece on Andy Beckstoffer recently, um, but our fairly sophisticated marketing questions about pricing. Um, uh, there is a question though for Russell that I think Russell, you could answer right now, which is how does your wine from the Tench Vineyard compare to other people's wines who, um, who other people who also make wine from this fabulous small vineyard? Is it like a chicken? You give it to, you know, it, Thomas it, Keller, or you give it to another famous chef, and it all turns out differently. Well, this goes back to what Tor so eloquently said earlier: is much of Napa is like Burgundy. How many Batard Montrachet producers are there, and how little amount of Batard Montrachet is there? 
And at Tench, the Margaret Rem and Brian and Adair of the Tench family have done such Fantastic. a beautiful job of taking this piece of dirt and then divvying it up into different slices. And so the rootstock and the clone of Cabernet varies from block to block. The row orientation varies from block to block. And so each parcel is a little different. And because of my, my partnership with the Tench family, um, I've been able to make pieces of wine, wine from each of these pieces. And each parcel oh, varies so much because the soil changes. Mm -hmm. As Thor was saying, there's ribbons. We have four different soil types in this mm -hmm. one vineyard, and each mm -hmm. one is different. Then each rootstock, whether it be uh, a 10114 or Schwartzman, brings a different component. Then a different mm -hmm. clone of Cabernet, whether it's seven or yeah, four or 337, changes it. And then the row orientation. So having made the same style from each block and each one being completely different, I know that there is no way you're going to make a wine duplicate from block seven that you do from block one. For and let me, colors, may, I, may I just say for everyone listening, um, you know, the idea of a vineyard can be, people can imagine something big. The idea of a block even, people can imagine something big. But if we're talking about these vineyards and these blocks, these blocks could be the size of your kitchen. The, the, almost, I mean, maybe a kitchen in Atlanta or something, but you know, a big kitchen, but they're not huge places, right? They're very, so the kinds of differences that Russell is talking about are happening in microscopic places of land. It's not happening over, you know, vast expanses of land, right? So, Yes, I felt like a Jack Russell Terrier. I, I almost interrupted you eight times there. But I, 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 so we make one wine from Tench block one, and then there's one little sliver that is literally half of an acre, and that's Tench the Calixtro, and it's completely different. It's adjacent, it's completely different. As I barrel tasted it one time, I went through and I was looking at my notes. I'm like, this is not the same, but it's same rootstock, same clone. There's just one little chunk where Mother Nature gave us a little different profile. And it's so completely different that those barrels deserve to be bottled by themselves because they represent their own unique excellence that's so different, which means you got to create a different skew, which means you have to occult, uh, blah, blah, blah. My business partners scream at me there. You want to bottle 75 cases? Yes, because it's so fabulous. People that are watching this love wine, they want to try that little slice of unique fabulousness. And that's what being a winemaker and, and being a part of Oakville is all about. Tours ribbons, each ribbon is different and each one has excellence. And that's the and, burgundy and, kind of connection as well. I want to I, I wanted change. to say something else there, Karen, is that I, I love to see Russell's passion there is, you know, this really is what gets us up in the morning, puts a smile on our face and, and lets us charge out that door is, uh, you know, is that kind of passion and, of and, you know, we're making lots of wine. These bottlings are a hundred cases, a couple hundred cases. They're so small. Um, but that's what pushes our buttons. That's what yep. excites us. And, and hopefully it does the consumer out there. Yes. So, um, I want to ask, I want to switch gears here for a second. I completely agree. But um, I want to ask Suzanne a question because she is an artist by training um, and a, an accomplished artist. And, you know, we, we tend in our world to talk about wine from, I don't know, from the, from the, the what you did standpoint. Where did you choose this piece of ground? What did you do? How did you farm it? How did you make the wine? But when people think about art, they think about it in a different way, I think. And Suzanne, um, your father was an accountant, but you're an artist. And did you, um, have you thought about wine? Do you think about wine in a completely different way than he did? I think, you know, we are on the edge of discovering more about ourselves. We've been on this estate now for almost 40 years, 
And I feel like we're almost on a pioneer journey here because Cameron Perry, who's been our winemaker, just our third winemaker in our time here, um, he's since 2014, he joined us. And Cameron and I embarked on a journey to uh, take a look at our state. We have 165 total acres, 121 here in Oakville and 44 in the Oak Knoll ABA in the Yonville area. And we have these jewels, we have these things to take care of. So how do we approach replanting? How do we take a look at what the wines are that we're making and we can make them better through better farming techniques, through organic farming? through uh, trying, we just introduced Petit Verdot. That's the first new red varietal we've introduced to the estate ever. I mean, I can't believe we haven't tried these things, right? My parents have tried Merlot, they've tried Cabernet with great success, and Justin started that off. But we are just at the beginning of this journey. So every year, Groth will now attack five acres at a time to sustain our production. You know, we take this from the Bordelais model. We, we learned, through replanting our reserve block, we had to start that under Michael Weiss's care, our second winemaker. He begged my parents to start replanting it because he was harvesting it sometimes as late as November. He was already buying grapes from Gene Phillips Young, Screaming Eagle. He knew he should be picking, you know, late September, early October, but the vines weren't doing it. So we finally convinced them to replant the vineyard. And then we had five vintages. We couldn't make a reserve Cabernet. So that was a lot of time out of the market with mm. our benchmark mm. wine. So we, as a family, said, we'll, we'll never do that again. What do we do to come up with a plan to sustain ourselves? So it, is it art? Sure, but every, every artist has to plan what they're going to do. So you look, Really? You really do? You really you don't move from instinct? You, no, I mean, I, mean I, I don't think Cameron moves from instinct. He's your winemaker. But you, you've yeah. taught yourself to be a good businesswoman. But still, <laughs> you're an artist at heart. Well, it's sink or swim, okay? So, I mean, it is, but I, I just love that, you know, Cameron talks about Petit Verdot as just a slightly different color from the palette. And I do, I like how he, you know, he can explain that to me because he's right. Pick up a brush full of yellow and, you know, combine it with some orange, some cadmium orange, and you're gonna get a different flavor. And it's not that he wants to completely throw out the bucket and plant Viognier, but, he wants to explore the different edges of these colors of Cabernet. And that's what we, we truly believe. I think Oakville believes, you know, we know, we know today Oakville is over 80% planted to Cabernet and supporting flavors of Cabernet Sauvignon, if you will, the great five, you know, varietals. But it is amazing to me that, you know, when we arrived here in 1982, less than, you know, 15, 20% of what was planted in Oakville was Cabernet Sauvignon. Villamont Eden, today Plum Jack, and of course, Tocolon was making incredible Cabernet, but there was a lot of Riesling and Chardonnay and Napa Gamay, and there was a lot of garbage that had been planted here and had to be replanted. And it not was, that Riesling is garbage, it's just not supposed well, to be in Oakville. I apologize. It was not right for Oakville. It was not right for Oakville, right. And we're still just, right. I think we're still just <laughs> um, <clears throat> However, I must oh, I say, too. there's ever a Bevin Tor or Groth Riesling. I want to be the first to taste it. I really do. Um, I do appreciate it. I agree. And and on that on that note, I think we um, we probably have to um, end in a second. Although, all right, Russell. I have a comment. What, Russell, what's up? Um, you got a comment? Okay. Uh, uh, the artist is Oakville. Winemakers who say they're artists. Are, are more narcissistic than I am, and that's an accomplishment, okay? A, a great winemaker, if there's any artistry, it's when you're blending, what, what Suzanne was just saying. That's a good and point. Then, and you can teach yourself that skill to some level, but some people are born with it. The artistry is respecting what Mother Nature gave you, having a clean winery, making common sense decisions, in fermenting things in a clean manner, having fresh barrels. And, and that's where the magic and artistry is. It comes from Oakville. Winemakers who think they're artists are way too full of themselves. And, and as somebody mm. who, who loves himself a lot, I'll tell you, I'm not an artist. So <laughs> the artistry is this terroir and the magic that 
the three of us try to create every year and just share with the world. It's not, and, it's not the people, it's that piece of dirt. That's that oh, piece wait of a dirt. second. It is, the, it is the people. I mean, we, we've gone through earthquakes, fires, now this virus uh, in all our lifetimes in Napa Valley. And I have to say, it's equal people to the magic terroir and soils and climates we have here. We have a pretty special neighborhood that we live in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put people in there too, including Karen. Oh, thank you. Um, and now I'm going to say, because um, everyone has been joining us for um, the thought 30 minutes or so, but um, of course it's been about an hour and we could probably keep going. I'm sure we could keep going. Um, I want to thank um, our three extraordinary panelists. And I, I want to hold up their wines again, because if you haven't tasted these wines, these wines are so worthy of your tasting and thinking about. Here's the Tour 2016 from the Tierra Roja Vineyard. Here is the Bevan um, Cellars 2016 from the Tench Vineyard. And here is the Groth Reserve 2016 from the Groth Estate. Um, three fantastic wines. I've enjoyed tasting them. I've, I've so enjoyed talking with the three of you though. Suzanne, Russell, Tor, thank you for being the people that you are and for being such extraordinary vintners. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, check out winespeed.com for um, the next Oakville uh, episodes, episodes four through six coming up. Um, it's gonna be hard to beat this one, I know, but we still want you to join us and taste along with us. So good night everybody, um, and please enjoy some wonderful Cheers. wine soon. Cheers boys. <laughs> Karen, thank you. <laughs>